So this is a conversation with Molly Krabappel. She's an artist and writer living in New York. It's a conversation that I've been meaning to have for a long time because it's on a topic that was actually the subject of my master's thesis in 2016. And it's one of those topics that those who know about it know a lot about and those who don't know about it don't know anything about. And that is uh, the legacy or the story of the Jewish labor bund or Bundists and the, the ideology uh, that is Bundism. I wanted to speak to Molly about this because of her personal connection. So sure, her great grandfather was himself a Bundist and she wrote about this story in an essay that I will link in the show notes in the blog post. I tried to in this conversation, hopefully successfully, to convey why myself, as someone of Lebanese and Palestinian origins, with no direct ties to Judaism or the Yiddish language, was so interested in this movement. So in this episode we'll be talking about Moni's view uh, on the leg- legacy of Buddhism, uh, what can we learn from this concept of doikait, or hereness, as opposed to the thereness of Zionism. And what are some of the more broader reflections on homeland, language, diasporism, and nationalism that we can get out of this experience that the Buddhists have had? So in essence, the idea of Doikait is that wherever one lives, that is one person's homeland. And obviously the contrast here that, that I just mentioned is that for Zionism, the homeland is somewhere else in what ended up becoming the state of Israel in historical Palestine. I hope that uh, by the end of this episode, Molly and I would have succeeded in making you more curious about the Bund. And if you are interested in reading and learning more about the Bund, you would be able to do so on the website. So as usual, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at FireTheseTimes and on Instagram at TheFireTheseTimes. If you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon or on BuyMeCoffee.com. You can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one-offs, and buymeacoffee.com has both options. Thank you for your time. Hey, I'm Molly Crabapple. I'm an artist and writer in New York City. I'm the author of two books, and I'm working on a third one about the Jewish labor bund. So thanks, Molly, for have this, th- having this conversation with me. This is a topic that uh, you and I have been talking about for a long time, uh, and we'll get a bit into this uh, later on. So we're talking about the Bund, the, the, the Jewish labor Bund, uh, also known as the Bundists, which is a topic that I know is close to your heart. So let's start, if it's okay, with you just telling us about who were the Bundists and uh, after that, just maybe also explain a bit, like, why do they matter to you personally? The Jewish Labor Bund was a Jewish revolutionary party that existed between 1897 and, well, there are still some um, descendants hanging around now, but basically it ended in 1945. It was a political party that was secular socialist, proudly and defiantly Jewish in an Eastern Europe that was incredibly racist against Jews and also was anti-Zionist and was armed. It started as an underground movement against the Tsar in Russia. It took part in the 1905 revolution, then the 1917 revolution, fell out horribly with the Bolsheviks, uh, reformed themselves in interwar Poland, became the most popular uh, Jewish political movement in the country, and finally were wiped out uh, in a defiant last stand in the Warsaw Ghetto, a revolt that they helped lead. And what's your personal connection to them? Uh, My great-grandfather was a member of the Bund back in Belarus. Now, it might sound strange to be so into one's great grandfather but um <laughs> i know i know right like it's 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 kind of a long way off but um my whole fam my my mom's whole family are artists and my great grandfather was almost like a, a father to her and so i grew up entirely surrounded by his paintings and uh, by his like self published philosophy books by stories about him I, I felt really 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 close to sam when i was growing up and one of my favorite bodies of work that uh, Sam painted was uh, during World War II, he painted a series of hundreds and hundreds of these watercolors that were like documentary uh, drawings from memory of uh, Volkovisk, which was his hometown back in Belarus. And they were of all sorts of things, right? Like they were of 
naughty little boys at religious school who were drawing mean pictures of the rabbi and then were getting their asses kicked. Uh, they were of like him climbing a tree to spy on girls taking baths in the river. <laughs> there are, you know, all, sor- all sorts of things, um, you know, of holidays, of fights, of uh, a fire that wrecked the town, pogroms. But there was one that uh, I was obsessed with and it was this picture of this girl and she had like, a little corset and you know pretty long skirt uh, and her hair was all done up like a Gibson girl <laughs> and it was at night and she was on the street and she was throwing a rock through a window and next to her was her boyfriend who was holding a sack with more rocks because you know a lady should not have to carry her own rocks when she <laughs> wants to go smashing windows and the title was Itka the Bundist and I remember maybe I was like 19 or something and I was like Bundist, what the hell is that? Because this was so different than anything that I thought I knew about what life was like in these small Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, or especially what life was like for women, right? Mm -hmm. And so that sent me on this quest to learn about the Bund, to figure out what it was. And as I realized more about its prominence and indeed its eminence in this part of the world, to wonder why it had been so erased from history. Yeah, it has uh, indeed been erased from history. I've, I, um, I'll talk a bit about my my relationship to, to this topic. It's not uh, personal in the sense, so I don't have, you know, a great grandfather with the, this cool story, unfortunately for me. But um, I discovered the Bund uh, while, while doing my master's at SOAS. And I had found this book, uh, which I later bought, like uh, several months later. But at the time, I didn't know what it, I didn't know what to do with it. Basically, it was just this random book that was written by a Yiddish uh, poet, and his uh, pen name is Yehoash, from what I remember. Oh uh, wow! So you were reading Yehoash then? I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, by the way, he translated Khalil Gibran into Yiddish. He did indeed. That's 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 the that's why he was such a random random find for me. It wasn't the um well jewish studies section at the library from what i remember and so he, he went so basically he went to palestine in 1914 and he wrote this book like a decade later a big big book and then in english it, it was translated as the feet of the messenger um which i still have on me and in this um uh, book he talks about some things that are just very interesting stuff like in the uh uh, like again in Palestine in 1914, he would be seeing people conversing in like half Yiddish, half Arabic because you know some of the early Jewish migrants uh, from either the previous generation or even two generations, some of them would have known Arabic by then, by, by then and so on. And then he he so he mentions all of this, and then at some point he basically says that I forgot what's the exact sentence, but something along the lines of um, oh actually I have it in front of me Yiddish in Tel Aviv is taboo. To speak Yiddish in public requires the utmost courage. And this was in 1923. So like, long story short, I ended up dedicating half a year to just studying this whole phenomenon, this whole study, this, I mean, this whole period and everything, and writing, then writing my master's thesis about it. And what, uh, so in addition to this uh, oddity, what really attracted me to to the, um, the Bundists um, at the time is their focus on language? So the fact that, uh, and you mentioned it yourself in 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 a in a talk recently, which I will I will link all of this in the in the descriptions uh, anyway. But like that, they you know they found a homeland um, in Yiddish in the language, and uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, you know my own thing with languages. But you yourself are also lang- uh, learning languages. From what I know, there's at least five uh, to d- different extents. Uh, though, though none is none as good as you speak any of your bajillion i i feel very <laughs> very dilettante i think i'm good for an american which is a pretty low bar um i mean i i studied arabic and i continue to study mm-hmm. arabic very seriously just because i because i love it you know i love um contemporary arabic literature i love reading if some azim or sinan antun or i mean or kind of funny i mean I, rashid hussein like i i just i love it um and i I study Spanish because, you know, it's my father's language. Mm-hmm. And right now I'm uh, studying Yiddish so that I can read basically all of the original um, source materials for the Bund. And, you know, the Bund, they had a really interesting relationship with Yiddish. When they started, the people who founded the Bund, not only did they not really give a shit about Yiddish, most of them didn't speak it. Because mm-hmm. there was this real... Um, so in for some backstory... In um, Tsarist Russia, 
uh, there was a place called the Pale of Settlement, which were the westernmost provinces of the empire. And those were the only places that Jews were allowed to live, unless they were like rich or a student or got special permission. But in general, like you were kind of stuck living there. And there are all of these uh, restrictions around you, uh, you know, whether you could go to university, uh, owning land where you could live, basically like a whole sort of uh, racist um, legal structure that was uh, meant to quarantine and, and confine Jews. And if you were um, someone like my great grandfather who was poor and who was an apprentice leather worker, you probably kind of lived in an all Jewish world where, you know, you worked at like a like a crappy little leather tannery and your boss was <laughs> Jewish and you're Jewish and you live on the Jewish side of town. And so you spoke Yiddish. That, that was just, you know, your language. But if you were someone who was a bit more um, upper class, someone, or not even upper class, let's say you were middle class, but let's say you had aspirations. You would be wanting to learn Russian. And not mm -hmm. only that, you would idolize Russian. You'd, it'd be the language of Tolstoy and Pushkin and Dostoevsky. It would be a, a great imperial language, you know, capital G. And it would also be the language of social mobility because it would let you, you know, go to university in St. Petersburg. So as is uh, common in many, many social movements, the people who founded the Bund were uh, largely uh, rebellious students who um, spoke Russian as um, their main language and maybe knew like a little bit of Yiddish, but not really. And they embraced and learned Yiddish because they had been exiled back to the Pale of Settlement for their political activities. They had been instructed by Marx to organize the workers because the proletariat is the agent of history. And the Jewish proletariat in Vilna did not fucking speak Russian. They spoke <laughs> Yiddish. And so these, these students that founded the Bund needed to speak the language that the people spoke. Now, what was interesting is that this purely utilitarian uh, decision started to slowly morph into something else, where Bundists, um, both like the more intellectual folks, but also the, the worker, the Jewish workers, started being like, wait a second, why, sh why do we have to fucking learn Russian? Why do we have to speak the language of empire? Why isn't our language, our minority language, good enough? And um, they started nourishing and glorifying yeah, Yiddish literature, um, Sholem Aleichem, Peretz, people like that, and um, trying to uh, focus on their own culture. And this was something that they did to lesser or greater extent in in Russia, but it was something that went into overdrive as soon as uh, they were kicked over the border into Poland. And, I mean, the Bund was responsible for an entire network of secular Yiddish schools, of poetry readings, of choruses. They had some of, like, the best fucking music, man. Like, just, like, <laughs> gorgeous, angry, uh, romantic, um, like, stamp your feet style, you know, protest anthems. They, they excelled in that, in, in Yiddish. And a lot of it was this reaction, this sort of, like, no, our culture is good enough. We're good enough. And... It was happening at a time when all over Europe, different groups like Polish people, you know, uh, Greeks, uh, Serbians, you know, there was they were trying to define this like ethnically based nationalism, mm -hmm. which went in horrifically fucked up directions, as we all know. But the Bund was trying to do that, but without the borders and without the blood and without the ethnic cleansing that so many other groups seemed to pursue it to. They were just trying to do it as a matter of pride. As fate would have it. Um the Bund was officially founded on the same year as the, what was it called? The World Zionist Congress was founded. Yes. Uh, and so this this is kind of, it's kind of like a tale of two worlds in a sense. Obviously interlinked and, you know, there were some people who were sort of in between and whatnot. But it is absolutely fascinating that um, people don't know, for example, uh, something else. So, uh, another story that when I was reading it, it like caught my mind so much that it ended up being the the introduction to to the to the thesis that I wrote, and so I'll, I'll just tell the story because I, I think honestly people should know this. So uh, I have it in front of me. So in January of 1945, a well-known um, heroine, basically of the anti-Nazi resistance in in the Vilna ghetto, I'm gonna butcher her name, uh, Rush, Rushka Korchak, uh, was invited to inco a conference in then Palestine, in what would become Israel, uh, to speak 
about her experience fighting the Nazis. That was the topic of the, the her, her talk. And so obviously being a Jew from Lithuania, she spoke the language of, uh, as you mentioned, of the Eastern European Jews, so Yiddish. So most of the audience also spoke Yiddish, so she, every, everyone, so everything was in Yiddish and her speech was well received and everyone applauded and everything. And then uh, this guy, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm dramatizing the story here, but this guy uh, at some point stands up and says, um, he thanked her for his speech, even though, and here I'm quoting, it was done in a foreign grating language. <laughs> and he said this in Hebrew. So the audience was so shocked that they actually prevented him from finishing everything, everything that I'm saying here, everything I have, everything double sourced and everything, because I didn't believe it myself at first. So they were so shocked by, by what he said that they actually booed him down, basically. But what's very weird about this story is that the guy who actually like was basically obsessed with the fact that this Yiddish speaker was speaking in Yiddish was none other than David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, obviously, the pretty much the founder of the state of Israel. And what's even weirder, obviously, is that David Ben-Gurion himself was a native Yiddish speaker. He was born David Green in Poland. So... This whole phenomenon I ended up being called a Kulturkampf, so like a non-violent civil war, I guess, a cultural war, essentially. One historian, I forgot what was his name, Halkin something, he, call, he called it one of the great Kulturkampf, the non-violent civil wars of Jewish history. And the, this, I mean, it's not just about language, obviously, a lot of it is about uh, now what, what we'll be talking a bit about the whole concept of doikite, so hereness instead of this. Uh, other um, thereness, in a sense, uh, which ended up being Zionism. So uh, I'll just ask you to talk a bit about Doikat, actually. I'll just end on this note. And what what's really fascinating to, fascinating to me is that a whole movement, a whole ideology that ended up being symbolized, essentially, by two supposedly opposing languages. So Yiddish for the, for the, for the Bundists and obviously Hebrew for the Zionists. There were Bundes who spoke Hebrew, there were Zionists who spoke Yiddish. It's always more complicated than just one or two. But essentially, that was that, that became the story. And because of that, uh, people like David Ben-Gurion in the 40s and the 50s and up until the 60s, essentially, were aggressively, aggressively clamping down on Yiddish. Like people were being spat on. There were like flyers all over Palestine and, and then uh, Israel, like in Tel Aviv and so on. Po posters, including posters in Yiddish, uh, which is very ironic, uh, telling people you should only speak in Hebrew and that kind of thing. I mean, they had to do it in Yiddish because most people obviously spoke Yiddish. So yeah, there is that. And for me, it's just it's it, it's just one of those stories that ended up just like I felt like I've been carrying it for years now. This is actually the first time that I talk about it. So I'll have this awkward segue into this concept of um, doikite. So doikite, it's it's the poster that is going to be the the featured image of this podcast. Uh, this episode, which is, you know, essentially, um, what's that sentence? Uh, wherever you are, that's home, essentially. Here where can I you... stand is my country. There it is. So can you talk a bit about Doikite? To talk about Doikite, I need to give um, a little context mm -hmm. into why it was so important that Bundists said, here where I stand is my homeland. Since the um, late 1880s, there had been a mass, or the early 1880s, there had been a mass migration out of um, the Russian Empire. Some of it spurred by pogroms, uh, some of it spurred by uh, changes in laws that made it really, really hard for you, know, you to live in the capital. Uh, some of it spurred by just like the crap economic conditions there and just real poverty. Uh, most, the vast majority of um, this mass migration was to um, America and mm -hmm. to countries in South America, like Argentina. Some of it also was to Western Europe, and a trickle of it was uh, to Palestine. But it was, it was hard to stay in the Russian Empire if you were a Jew because of the poverty, because of the racism, and just because, it, in general, it was, it was an, an extremely oppressive autocracy. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, Jews were not viewed as Russians they were viewed as aliens and foreigners, and they were viewed as racially different. This is something really important. Um, people can argue like whether or not you know Ashkenazi Jews are European or not, but they weren't viewed as European, mm -hmm. and um, they weren't they weren't treated they weren't treated as that. They were treated as um, a treacherous alien other, and one of the things that Bundists saw really early about Zionism was that Zionism and uh, European anti-Semitism share a lot of things in common. 
uh, one of which is the belief that uh, Jews don't belong in Europe and should get the mm. hell out. And when the Bundists were saying, here where I stand is my country, they were saying, no, I'm not going to go to Palestine. But it was something more than that. It was saying, here where I stand is my country. And if you have a problem with that, then I have a gun and I will fight you. <laughs> and so much of um, the popularity of the Bund in Jewish communities in Eastern Europe was because they were a proud armed group that defended the entire community against pogroms. They did it in 1905. Uh, they did it in 1917. They did it in interwar Poland and um, some of the earliest uh, fights against the Nazis, fights that happened even before the Warsaw Ghetto was built, uh, were launched by Bundists, and they did it also as, as resistance fighters. And so to say, like, this is my home, it wasn't just this sort of, like, squishy, you know, hug refugees, tolerance, like, I love Thai food shit. It was actually um, a very defiant act. And uh, so... I didn't even mention this because I'm an idiot, but you actually wrote an essay on on uh, your great my great grandfather the Bundes, which again I will I will link um, in the description, and you mentioned that it's been translated into Arabic and shared by like some Palestinian networks and so on. This uh, brings me a bit to uh, the reason why I I got into um, again talking uh, studying and researching the Bund is that. This um, relationship with the language is something that obviously Palestinians, uh, a lot of whom, well, most of whom are in exile, uh, know quite well. And something that the language, the literature, Arabic, obviously, in this case, became this uh, big focus of identity with obviously names like Mahmoud Darwish becoming this, uh, well, essentially a symbol of, of either the nation or the people or whatever, uh, depending on people's interpretations. But the for me, the fact that there were kind of these parallel stories, um, uh, simplifying a bit here, but like the story of Buddhism, the story of, of Zionism, and um, Zionism in the end won, quote unquote, the story, the, the, the culture comes, so again, this cultural war. Uh, but it's important, obviously, to note here that, as you mentioned with Russia, the Holocaust, I mean, the Holocaust, obviously, is, is the big culprit here. The vast majority of, of uh, Yiddish speakers who were killed during that period were killed in the Holocaust. And then um, uh, the policies under uh, Stalin obviously were anti, pretty much anti, anti-Yiddish. And on the cultural level, obviously, you have the assimilation of, of many Yiddish speakers into American culture, kind of losing that Yiddish and ended up Yiddish becoming sort of synonymous today with a style of comedy and, you know, an accent and that kind of thing uh, in, in parts of America, especially in New York. And then uh, the other, the fourth component in a sense of why Yiddish ended up being weakened is, as we mentioned before, the, the policies of the Israeli government. So I want to I wanna talk um, a bit about that, uh, not necessarily about the policies themselves, people can just look them up and everything, but more about like, um, to in the past years, uh, there's no real way of dating when when ha this has been happening. Just before we talked, we started talking, I found this article from 87 saying that there is a revival of of uh, sorry of uh, Yiddish in Israel, for example, and there are like if you look at these headlines, you'll find like one every two three years. <laughs> yes. And so I mean, which obviously says that the, the revival isn't really really there. You have some pockets here and there, but it's not something. Obviously, it's not supported by the state, for example, for the reasons that we mentioned before. But what for me is something that, um, uh, and as usual, I'm going to have one of these awkward segues. But what really fascinated me about um, um, about the, the the Jewish Bund is this uh, aggressive, as you mentioned, like this aggressive, uh, aggressive in a good way here, aggressive. Um, how do I say this? Uh, affirmation or okay, reaffirmation of their Jewishness. So it's not like this. This was a movement of people who. Um, kind of were encouraging only assimilation, for example, which uh, Zionists actually, many early Zionists um, accused Bundists of wanting to do for that matter. Uh, I have some records from like 1905, 1906, and there were debates sometimes, letters being sent from one Bundist to one Zionist. Some <laughs> of them are, are pretty funny. But there was this notion of we know who we are and we want to strengthen and we will defend it. And the, the, the concept of doikait for me is something that's very personal because, and this is what I meant by the, awkward, the very awkward segue, 
it's very personal because um, I have a grandfather um, Palest who's Palestinian. For me, when I when I think of the homeland, it's something that's very vague. It's very ill-defined. It's something that changes a lot depending on when I'm I'm thinking about it, for that matter. And the the reason why I ended up kind of sheltering, finding shelter in a sense, in languages is because uh, you know once you're in a language, you essentially you're like in the same re same reason why you're learning Yiddish. It opens you up to this. Um, well, to a world, essentially, especially through literature. What I'm thinking of today, part of the, the um, one of the arguments that I was making in the thesis is that you we're seeing this comeback, finally seeing this comeback, not in Israel, but in America. And uh, not that it's not, there are small pockets in Israel. I interviewed someone uh, who was by then in London. Um, I forgot the name of the group now something babel something uh and he was uh, well he, he was a native uh, hebrew speaker and he was um teaching hebrew to people uh in london that's how i learned a bit of hebrew and from a specific perspective that is explicitly anti-zionist and explicitly di uh, diasporist as they called it which meant that for him in the same way as you have those uh, birthright uh, trips, you know, to go to Israel and then many of them would learn Hebrew there, you know, you get they get intensive classes or whatever. Uh, he wanted to teach people Hebrew for people who did want to learn Hebrew, but decoupling it from this, uh, well, ideological baggage that came with it, that usually comes with it. And this is something that I find interesting. I don't necessarily believe that everyone should have to learn Yiddish or else, you know, there's no way of being Jewish or anything like that. And plus, that's none of my business. I'm not Jewish myself. But from like, from the, the distance I have in Islam, the privilege that I have and kind of having this uh, distance between me and, and this culture camp, this cultural, the cultural wars of the past, which is sort of happening now in the in this reemergence of the a, a, a very, very vocal Jewish left in America which obviously you're a part of. And we saw, you know, the phenomenon in Bernie Sanders to a certain to a certain extent. Obviously, we saw the the um, I forgot their names now, the if not now groups, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace to a certain extent as well. And a bunch of others whose again names I'm I'm very bad at remembering. But those are legacies in a sense that had this erasure, spatial and temporal erasure uh, that as we mentioned, is the Holocaust and Stalin and uh, everything else. Had this not happened, then it would have been even more obvious to say, well, these people are just the, they've inherited uh, the legacy of the Bund. Did that make sense? Well, I just, <laughs> I don't know if I just it, grabbed it, it for no did. reason. So I have like two notes that I always want to give on Yiddish. I mean, the first thing is that while um, the vast majority of Jews in America are Ashkenazi, the majority of Jews in Israel are, are not. And mm -hmm. um, Israel, it didn't just wage a war on Yiddish, it waged a war on all diaspora Jewish mm -hmm. languages, like, you know, the Ladino of the Ottoman Empire, the Arabic that Jews spoke, um, you know, the, the, the many languages that Jews spoke because they lived all over the world. Um, I think that sometimes the war against Yiddish was a little bit more bitter because the uh, political founders of Zionism spoke Yiddish and you can never, yeah. like, kind of hate, except if you're hating people who are like you. Um, the other thing, though, that I always want to say with Yiddish, and it's kind of one of the ironies, is that Yiddish isn't a dead language. It's There are millions of Yiddish speakers, na native mm -hmm. Yiddish speakers. They're just Hasidic. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things about the Boon that was interesting was they were militantly anti-religious. They were proud Jews in the ethnic sense. But um, they loathed religion. They served pork at their meetings. They hung up um, posters on synagogue walls on Friday night because they knew that no one could you know, take them down until Saturday night. They <laughs> smoked on Yom Kippur. Um, they did everything they possibly could, almost in the manner of um, many generations of um, naughty Catholic schoolboys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the boon, the boon definitely came from that perspective. And so the irony is that while their children in America forgot Yiddish and assimilated sort of into the American left in the 60s and rock and roll, the children of a group that they like very much disliked are actually the, the inheritors of Yiddish a, as a living language. And it's something I didn't think about until a formerly Hasidic guy started making fun of me and my, my Yivo pronunciation <laughs> of Yiddish. Um, but I think, what was I going to say about... Um, 
I had a, I had I had so many thoughts that were that were spurred by when you, when you, when you were talking, and now I'm kind of, I find myself kind of kind of tripping over them. I mean, I think that the Boone's embrace of Yiddish in especially interwar Poland, it reminds me of um, another group uh, that my that I was always familiar with and that my you know dad knew a bunch of members of, which is the Young Lords, which was a militant uh, Puerto Rican uh, group that came out of Chicago mm. and um, has many similarities to the Bund, everything from like, you know, the sort of like working class ethnic pride to the being revolutionary socialists to the making sort of ersatz power paramilitary uniforms to uh you know the civil disobedience and law breaking stuff and I, I mean i think it's something very natural when you're a minority that's always been told that you're shit you've always been told your culture is shit you've always been told you don't have a literature that you uh don't you know that you don't have a history worth celebrating you don't have a tradition and for you to say like no we do have a literature we do have a history we do have a language i mean i, I see this sort of you know, self-assertion and pride with like many of my Kurdish friends also who might not even speak Kurdish but are trying to learn it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something I'm sure that like many people who struggle to like preserve indigenous languages uh, feel. And it's certainly something that, that the Bund felt in um, their struggle to, to elevate Yiddish. Um, as for Yiddish coming back, as far as I know, like the only dead language that ever came back was Hebrew. Yeah. And um, only with, you know, a genocide and the most state brutality possible. I think that dying and dead languages don't come back because languages take a really, really long time to learn. And mm. people have other things that they want to do, like, you know, go on dates and watch Netflix and stuff. <laughs> uh, however, there is actually there is certainly like a small and really dedicated group of people uh, that that I know and I suppose that I'm part of that that are studying Yiddish and interestingly uh, not all of them are Jewish like mm. when I was taking the crazy YIVO summer intensive program I had a guy in my class who is Egyptian who was learning Yiddish because he was like trying to he's trying to like do a thesis on like nationalist cinema in Egypt and Israel and then realized uh, yeah. how influenced I, like, I know who you're talking about. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I met like uh, I met like a Lithuanian cartoonist, you know, a, a Christian Lithuanian Christian background Lithuanian cartoonist who uh, was learning Yiddish cuz she was trying to do this project about like these Yiddish teenage autobiographies that were, you know, done in Lithuania to understand her country's history. Um, I think it's really really cool that people that aren't Jewish are studying it because it means it's actually like it's actually a legit language with a legit history as opposed to something that people um, only study to read their grandmother's cookbook even though it's totally <laughs> cool and valuable to read your grandmother's cookbook totally uh, I took uh, just a couple of hours of Yiddish uh, while at SOAS because um, uh, again forgetting the names here Jesus uh, there was the there was an institute next to SOAS um, that was giving these summer courses. I'm sure people can just Google if they Google Yiddish London, they'll probably find it in the first page. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it was obviously it sounds I, I, I also learned a bit of German. So it sounds like German in my mind uh, and indeed, obviously, lots of common words and so on. But what's what's I mean, what's different about it is that the alphabet is obviously not Latin. And um, I have a the poster, which again is going to be, be the preview image of, of this episode, is a poster that I, uh, I've had behind me for a long time. It confuses a lot of my uh, Arab friends when they enter the room and they think that I, I just have this random poster in Hebrew behind me. Oh, it's, it's in Yiddish, but you know, people wouldn't know the difference. And so what, what the reason why I would put it is to kind of be a bit provocative, uh, which I tend to like to do sometimes. Um, and because the message on it is amazing. The message is just something that I can relate to. It's something that anyone who's interested in anything from like, I don't know, uh, democratic socialism, some liberals might be interested in it, mutual aids, anything that... Um, has this need to create something better than what is currently the case, basically creating a new world. Because like one thing that um, I found fascinating for very different reasons about uh, Zionism and, and the revival of the Hebrew language is the fact that it succeeded at the end of the day. Obviously, it succeeded with violence. That goes without saying. Uh, but the reason why it succeeded is because also there was this dedication and this dedication was top down again, uh, going back to the violence, 
but it's something that people should know. I, I honestly, I'm I'm not even kidding when I say that many people that I speak to, uh, including folks from from like the region from from Lebanon, especially from Palestine, I would assume more people do know this. But from Lebanon, uh, in my experience, many people don't even know that Yiddish, uh, sorry, that Hebrew went through an actual revival, like active revival of people forcing themselves to speak it because they themselves didn't speak it. And there were there are so many stories of um, there's a there's an Israeli scholar, um, again with the names Jesus Avi Lang, I think if I'm if I if I remember correctly, I'll I'll find it and find her essay and put it online. And she mentions how her father or grandfather or someone in her family uh, spoke Yiddish as a native language, but uh, growing up in, I'm going to say Tel Aviv because I can't remember, uh, he was pat on, like attacked uh, and everything to the point where he would only speak it within the confines of his home. And then as soon as he leaves, he would obviously leaves the house, he would obviously speak in Hebrew. And this is something that many immigrants um, can relate to, you know, uh, stories of Arab immigrants to America who only speak English or who don't teach Arabic to their kids. This, it's such such a common story at this point that this is why for me, it, it just feels like a missed opportunity. And it's why I wanted to have this episode with you to actually encourage people. And hopefully after having this episode, they will go on that blog post of mine on the website which will have hopefully a lot, a lot of links. I'll try and remember everything that I just mentioned and, and more about a movement that actually tried to do it. And the fact that they quote unquote failed doesn't actually say anything about the movement itself. It doesn't actually say much about the value of the movement, the, the value of the ideals of the movement anyway. But people need to understand that for especially the early Zionists like David Ben-Gurion himself, and here I'm quoting Avi Lang again, um, for early Israel, Yiddish stank of the ghetto. It was the demotic of the persecuted, the victim, the murdered. And the contrast to this, obviously, the weak, the myth of the weak Jew is a strong Jew. The, the Hebrew speaking Sabra, Sabra being the name of, of um, uh, the Jews who were born in, in uh, what ended up becoming the state of Israel, the new ones, essentially. Sabra is the name of a cactus, I think, uh, in the desert or something. Yeah, a so spiny like, cactus. Yeah, so like resilience, essentially. That's that's the idea. And so this contrast between something that is supposedly weak and something that's supposedly strong, we need to think about this. Like, we need to think of what does it mean for an entire state to be formed and created on this idea of something that is strong, because this is obviously gendered. Indeed, many early Zionists would, would actually describe Yiddish as kind of this effeminate language. They would explicitly use these terms and they felt the need to erase it. If there, if there is, if the, so I'll, I'll just end on this note. If there is a need to erase something, especially something that is their own mother language for, for a lot of these cases, like been, David Ben-Gurion himself, it's definitely worth asking the question why. What is it about what it's not about the language itself, but what did it represent essentially for it to be such a threat? And that's why I was I again, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you. And I want I'm urging people to just literally Google Doikite. I'll write it down somewhere in the description and you will be uh, hopefully positively surprised at how many things you will find under this concept and this topic and and this includes you people in recent years kind of rethinking it so one another of my now famous uh, awkward segues <laughs> uh, here hereness uh, again the the idea of wherever we are that is our homeland the recent weeks have been particularly tough in uh, New York where you are um, as I'm pretty much most, I think most people would probably know by now. Can you reflect a bit on how a concept like this for you can be translated into the concept of the kite, can be translated into some of the mutual aid networks that we've been seeing that I, I, for me has been like probably, probably the best, uh, one of the few lights in this horror show that we're seeing right now in the US. Have you really uh, re revisited basically in the past few weeks uh, some of these uh, writings you own, the book that you're writing, the story of your great grandfather, maybe poems or whatever. Ha have, has this kind of come back in a sense? I actually wanted to segue on something else that you were talking about, which is mm -hmm. uh, strength. 
And yes. um, the myth of, you know, the weak ghetto Jew versus the strong, you know, Israeli Sabra. One of the reasons that um, the Boone's legacy is so problematic, in, or not that it's so problematic, but one of the reasons that the Boone's legacy has been so deliberately erased in Israel is because the Boone represents that that dichotomy was always bullshit. This founding literary document of the weak Jew, strong Jew thing, is a poem that was written uh, after the Kishinev pogrom mm -hmm. uh, by uh, the Hebrew poet Chaim Bialik. That's called City of Slaughter. Uh, the Kishinev pogrom was, uh, so I forget the exact number, but over 100 Jews were killed. And also um, there was a lot of uh, rape of Jewish women. And it was a hideous pogrom. It it's, was something that echoed all around the world. It was something, images of the dead were distributed on mass media. And Chaim Bialik had um, by, been sent by uh, the Jewish... Uh, Yiddishist historian Shimon Dubnov to uh, collect survivor testimonies in the aftermath of the pogrom. And he collected these testimonies and then he sort of chucked them. And he wrote this poem about the disgusting, bowing, scraping, weak ghetto Jew that allows his wife to be raped in front of him because he's hiding in a toilet. Mm. It says things like they died like dogs and they, like dogs they were dead. It is a howl of self-hatred. And a massively influential poem uh, for, for Zionism and um, something that established his name as a Hebrew poet, um, a major document. But it was all fucking bullshit, and he knew it was bullshit. Um, in the Kishinev pogrom, it was not that men passively allowed their wives to be raped while they hid. Men fought back, and so did women. Uh, but they were just overwhelmed with superior numbers. Uh, but they were tough working class people who fought and uh, not just, you know, fought one on one, but organized um, armed militias uh, mm. and were put down by sort of force of superior numbers plus the police. So even the sort of like founding literary document, which was um, written in um, 1903, was uh, it was built on bullshit. And the truth was that Jews always fought back. Whatever one thinks of the Bolsheviks and Leon Trotsky, and I, I am um, not, a, not a fan, Leon Trotsky ran the Red Army. The idea that Jews didn't fight back until um, David Ben-Gurion and, and Jabotinsky and um, you know the Haganah and the Ergan and the Palmach came is such fucking a historical bullshit that I don't even understand how it, um, how it passes in... Um, in sort of common parlance. And I think the thing about the Bund was, first, yes, they were an armed group that um, ran some of the most heroic and sort of legendary self-defense militias in, in Russia and later in Poland, and then you know helped lead the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt. Like, they did it as Jews. They didn't just um, do it as, you know, as Bolsheviks, as communists, the way that, that Trotsky did. And I think that that's very upsetting to a narrative that always posits uh, Jews back in the old country as weak and simpering and cowardly. And I think that that specifically is why Israel has had such a problem um, with their story. One of the, um, I'm not sure if I actually have a, a, a point to this, but I just remembered when you were talking. Um, one of the things that uh, we ended up uh, it became so I ended up so uh, just quick context. I took Hebrew at uh, while I was uh, doing my masters. That so I was part of. It ended up feeding into this thesis, obviously, but it was just a coincidence because it was being offered, and I like learning stuff. <laughs> but they um, showed us in class some of those awkward ads by the Israeli government, and I'm saying awkward because they're horrible, uh, and awkward because they really make no sense. But essentially, one of those ads, for example, is about the. Uh, well, I don't remember exactly, but it's something along the lines of. Uh, this Israeli woman, I think, uh, goes to New York, probably, or somewhere in America, and she ends up coming back to Israel, and then instead of saying shalom or something, she says hello or something like that. So she <laughs> ba basically, the story is that, you know, acculturation or assimilation, sorry, uh, is the main threat to, to a Jewish identity. But 
like the underlying message here is this very clear anti-diasporist in a sense and i mean even the, the term diaspora and diasporist these are all contentious terms i'm just using it kind of as a shorthand here it's not really my, my place to say who is diaspora whatever like, you know that's up to people themselves to figure that out but um the underlying message obviously is that even if you are an Israeli who goes to New York and only hangs out with American Jews, you're still losing something because the real uh, representative of Judaism, as Netanyahu himself loves, loves to self-proclaim constantly, or, uh, well, it's the Israeli state, symbolized in this ad or in these ads by the, the Israeli states. I think, by the way, there are like whole studies on this, so people are more free, uh, free to really just look these up. And another thing, and... Um, on this topic of erasure, basically, my interest into um, Yiddish and specifically uh, the politics of Yiddish. The polit so the thesis is uh, language politics. So the politics of Hebrew, the politics of Yiddish, and the contemporary debate. I forgot what it's called. The contemporary debate on on Zionism and diasporism or whatever. And the fact that for me something could be um, so important and powerful and we have documentation that it has been it was so important and powerful so the the bund and bundism in general and then within in the time span of a fraction really in its history because we're talking about a language that's like at least over a thousand years old uh, within two or three decades essentially really uh, being wiped out essentially at 90 percent or something I don't, I don't have the numbers but like a significant percentage of its speakers obviously killed uh, mainly in the Holocaust and then in the Stal Stalinist purges and then, uh, as we mentioned before, I'm not going to repeat. But that is for me the reason why I got so attached to, uh, well, at least for that period, I got so attached and so interested in learning about the Yiddish language because there are parallels to the Palestinian story and there are parallels to just stories of exile and migration and ethnic cleansing and all of these things, uh, I saw parallels with the Armenian story. I saw parallels with, uh, well, again, I just mentioned the Palestinian story. The Kurdish story is an obvious one as well. And this is why uh, it's it baffles me really that um, uh, you don't really have to comment on this if you don't feel like it. But for me, like as, as someone who's from Lebanon, especially, and who supposedly there's this narrative that uh, Lebanon is anti-Zionist and all of this, which, you know, is basically state, um, pretty much state ideology, or at least that's how people, uh, that's how it's performed, uh, I would say, in Lebanon, uh, in the performative sense. Despite all of this, there's basically zero effort, or there has been zero effort to actually learn the context of where all of this came from. And if people don't really understand the story of Yiddish, in the quote-unquote success or the quote-unquote victory of Zionism, then they're only looking at a small, uh, not small, but like a part of the of the story here. The the it's the so as I repeat, it's not small, obviously, but like the Nakba and the conflicts uh, between the so-called Arab-Israeli conflicts, those are part of the story. They're a big part of the story, obviously, a big part, especially of post-48 uh, um, state of Israel. But it's as we said, the 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 Congress, the World Zionist Congress, and uh, the first uh, Jewish Labor Bund meeting, whatever it was called, was 1897. So we're talking about pretty much half a century in between, and people really should know what happened in that half a century. Like that's it. It's I don't know if there are any other parallels. Maybe the Armenian story is one uh, a possible parallel of so much destruction in such a small amount of time, obviously referring here to the to the Holocaust, and the legacy of that being translated into these, ran, not random, but like weird um, and uh, historical trajectories. And here I'm referring obviously to the, to the state of Israel. So my point with all of this rambling is that uh, Bundism for me is not necessarily something that Oh, people should study because it was perfect and idealistic and everyone was fantastic. I mean, I'm sure there were problems as with everything. Oh, definitely. But, yes. I mean, <laughs> but it's important. It, uh, ha at least half a century of, of history. Uh, at some point, as you mentioned, the biggest, the biggest movement uh, from that community in, in the uh, so-called Pale of Settlements and so on. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry. You, you were saying something. So... 
One of the things, like one of the tragedies of Buddhism to me is that because they were uh, secular socialist internationalists, they, even though, you know, they were a proud Jewish movement, they were a movement that profoundly wanted to work with other groups, that they were a member of... um, I think it was the second, the second international. No, I'm sorry. They were, they were a member of one of the major um, international socialist groupings. They and they had this faith in the international working class that, when you read it in retrospect and you know what happened, sounds incredibly naive. Uh, mm. To the point where they're in the Warsaw ghetto, right? They're risking their lives and uh, foregoing food when they're starving to death to put out these uh, newspapers in Yiddish and in Polish as well, so that they could smuggle them out to the you know to their Polish comrades. And in these newspapers, they're writing about how they're not the main, they're not the main um, victims of Nazism because the German working class is also crushed under the boot of Nazism. Mm-hmm. That's, th- that's not true. I mean, not that the German working class wasn't crushed, but they were indeed the main victims of it. But they were always trying to uh, sort of see themselves in this like very internationalist framework. Mm-hmm. And after the war was over... Um, there were um, constant uh, lynchings of Jews in Poland, of people trying to return to their homes um, and found someone was in the home, and then the person who had uh, squatted in their home would, would kill them. Uh, there's also like a major pogrom um, in, a, I'm butchering the Polish pronunciation, but a Kielce, a Kielce, um based on a blood libel. So people had just right survived the Holocaust. Um, hmm. the, Jew- the Polish Jewish community was suffered more than any other Jewish community, I believe, in the Holocaust. It was, of the six million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust, three million were Polish Jews. Mm -hmm. And so they just survived this, and then their neighbors are lynching them, right? And it's just not a country you can be in. And the Bundists that survived are still trying to tell people, like, Doikait. And Jews then are like, no, I don't fucking want to stay here. And I was reading this um, memoir by Yaakov Pat, who was a Bundist, who he had fled in 39 and then he returned in 46 to distribute aid to the survivors. And every single person wants to get out of Poland and they're all sneaking over the border into Germany to go into the American occupied zone to get into these DP camps. And once they're in these um, these displaced persons camps, they're applying for visas to every fucking country in the world, to like Australia, Brazil, Canada, America, uh, anywhere they can, right? They just want to, they want to get out of Europe and they're getting rejected. And the Bund, the survivors that were able to like escape and to reconstitute in America, they built a pretty close relationship with the American labor movement and they were petitioning the government to give 400,000 visas to Jewish survivors. And the American government refused because they thought that they were communists and also because they were racist. And so you had these people that were rotting, right? One year, two years in DP camps, often guarded by Germans. And then suddenly you have a group like the Haganah that's coming in that's like, we can get you out of this DP camp. We can put you on a a smuggling ship and um, you can get your manhood and your dignity back and join a militia and go kill some other people. And it's this... I think one of the clearest examples I've ever seen of how a group of desperate refugees gets radicalized. Um, people who, if they had been given a visa to New York, for instance, they would never even have been Zionists necessarily. Mm. And in a Yaakov Pat's book, he has this part where he's just talking about how horrible it is in Poland. And he ends it by saying, in Poland, you can hear the ships. Whether they're going to America or to Palestine, I don't know. It was written in 1946. Mm. And I've always thought that there are many reasons, obviously, that um, Bundism collapsed, uh, the Nazi genocide, Stalin, American assimilation. But one of the reasons that's not appreciated is that after the war, when the remaining Bundists in America were asking for international solidarity and help for refugees, there was not an offer. And that you can only, as an oppressed group that's endured so much, keep saying, like, the world is good, your, your worker brothers will help you uh, for so long before people start believing, before people, I'm sorry, before people stop believing you and before other more racist and exclusionary groups tar- start taking advantage of, um, of that despair. 
No, I also, I wanted to return, because it was like such a smart thing you said about Doikite and the concept of New York. Mm. Now, I've often thought one of those kind of clarifying things about um, this horrific plague we're going through, and obviously this is not... Um, this is not a cut and dry rule whatsoever. There's a million exceptions. But mm -hmm. in general, if people have a choice about where they're going to be, right, for this, because we don't know when we're going to be able to move again, where you choose to be says a lot about where you think your home really is. And, um, you know, I'm in New York right now. Uh, I think there's like the New York Times say they think the death toll is like actually about 20,000 in New York City. Mm. Uh, um, though that's not the official death toll. And there's no place in the world that I would rather be. Um, this is my home. It's where my mother was born. It's where my father came when he was a little kid. It's where my family has been for a really long time. And I can't imagine leaving New York at a moment like this when it's suffering so much. I can't imagine not doing everything I could for my city right now. I might, you know, I, lo I love other places in the world. Like I, I, um, would love to live in some other city at some point, but not now. Now, this is my country, right? New York City is my country. And I, perhaps that sounds exclusionary, but it's a city of 9 million. There are many countries that are smaller than that. And people <laughs> say own. they're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you can say like Lebanon is my country, you can say New York City is my country. <laughs> I, I, don't think, I don't think one is any more petty than the other, right? Yeah. And um, this is a city that's become increasingly hard to live in if you're not rich because the rents are just too damn high and because you get, you know, chucked out of your apartment at the end of the year and the gentrification is off the hook and it's just, it's really hard, right? And now those um, same people who have been so instrumental in making the city completely unaffordable for the working class have fled to their summer mansions in Montauk. I, I don't I don't know what they're afraid of. Maybe they think that uh, the corona will come through the walls. I don't know. But they fled. And um, the working class of the city is dying because it's, you know, keeping the world running at, at risk of getting infected with the virus. And sometimes, like, when I walk the city streets late at night and they're completely empty, right, you almost feel like, yeah, like, this, this city is, well... This will sound strange, perhaps, but that all of the people who had kind of used the city, who had come here, you know, to make some cash, to, you know, have fun, but who didn't really love it, had left. And that mm. the city, um, for a moment, even in this horrific moment where it's dying and where um, the Trump administration is helping it die, even at this specific moment, it feels like the city belongs to its, its people again. And, yeah, I just, I love it here so much. And... I am doing everything that I possibly can to to help it, and and so are all my friends. Um, there's a huge amount of mutual aid that's been set up. Um, mm. I mean, there's a lot of poverty, right? Because people's rents are so high, and people are quite precarious here. And you know, people even who are like middle class people, they've lost everything overnight because they they can't work now. And so there's all sorts of initiatives to get food to people. Um, to support people who are rent striking. Uh, the, the largest rent strike in American history is going to kick off on May 1st uh, in New York. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to um, help older people, you know, get their food and get their meds. And just, like, lots of just giving each other money because everyone is kind of broke and trying to pool their resources. And, like, this isn't an official mutual aid thing, but in, in my building I have badass neighbors. I love them. And we're, we're cooking for each other. We, um, you know, do shopping for each other. We mail things for each other. Like, we just we just help each other in a way that, even though we always liked each other before and we were always friends before, we just never thought to do because New York is so busy, you know? Mm. And I have so many fears for what's going to happen with this city. I'm, I'm afraid that um, so many people are going to die and then these Jared Kushner-style developer vampires are just going to sweep in and buy everything up and turn this into, I don't know, Dubai with much worse infrastructure. Mm. Uh, but maybe something that could happen that was good would be that, you know, the the hedge fund bastards and the developer bastards and the rich kids that they left and that the city could return to being for its people again. And that may seem like a naive hope, 
but you know we have to, we must look for for hope at this moment well yeah i mean we've been talking about um well a movement that had to think that way i, I would i mean i can only imagine really i don't know how what 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 uh, what they went through i can't really picture it obviously but um suffice it to say that they definitely needed to have a sort of a vision or at least some kind of hope that things can get better in order well probably to get through the day i would assume so like on this note and again for like the 700th time and another awkward segue um i i found while you were talking i just remembered i had interviewed this guy and this would be kind of like my, my end note in a sense, and then I'll just leave it uh, up to you to, to, to end however you, you feel uh, most comfortable. I was interviewing this guy while I was in London, um, and he was the one who was running this, um, I think it, they just call it like a non-Zionist Hebrew class or something like that. And uh, he told me, and this is a quote that I have. Um, one sec, sorry, let me find it. Learning Hebrew, uh, outside of the realm of its participation in erasure and dispossession in Palestine, while at the same time deeply engaging with those processes from an oppositional, uh, oppositional standpoint. So this is what he was trying to do, basically. I don't know if they're still active now. Uh, they're called Babel, Babel's Blessing, by the way. And so uh, he, uh, someone who, sp who speaks Hebrew, as I said, uh, when he speaks to Palestinians, when he met Palestinians, including some of his students being Palestinians, when they call Hebrew the language of occupation, he can, and here I'm quoting, he can only nod in agreement, for this is their lived experience of a language that was forced on them, essentially. At the same time, when uh, Jews say that they want to learn Hebrew in a different way, and here I'm quoting him again, they are expressing their critique of Zionism and interest in diasporic Hebrew culture. So this is something that's very interesting to me. It's kind of like the... Uh, both worlds in a sense like the, di the diasporism on the one hand but because Yiddish isn't as popular anymore now there's Hebrew and kind of like Hebrew replacing Yiddish but in the context of diasporism essentially and there has been this um, I haven't seen it myself but I read a lot about it like a kind of a revival of that phenomenon in Berlin among uh a lot of Israelis actually who leave Israel and then just settle down in Berlin. There's kind of this countercultural thing going on. I don't know how active it is today, but I had read about this uh, while I was writing my thesis four years ago. And so I'll end, I'll end on this basically, and this is just his quote. When you speak Yiddish, you always think about the past, whereas when you speak Hebrew, you think about the present. It's a quote-unquote everyday language. Yiddish is the language which got fixated in the past with the Holocaust. And there is always this longing of going back and thinking about going in the past in the shtetl, a small Jewish town for those who don't know in Eastern Europe, and all of that. Hebrew doesn't capture this longing for the past. I was quoting someone else, actually. And then Hayim, the, the guy I was quoting at first, he says, I find in many cases that when Jews learn Arabic, Yiddish, and Hebrew in a decolonial diaspora context, as well as with anti-authoritarian teaching techniques, he was talking, by the way, about like the Paulo Freire, uh, ped pedagogy basically as well as with anti-authoritarian teaching techniques it not only correlates with them having views that are critical of Zionism but also facilitates exploring their, their own Jewish identities from different angles and in new stimulating ways end quote so like this is what I wanted to end on none as I as I mentioned before uh, this is not my business so to speak I'm not saying this is how someone who's Jewish should be or shouldn't be I'm just saying that I mean, I can, <laughs> this, you know, it could be such a tricky thing, especially as, as someone who's not uh, from the community. Uh, I'm simply saying that what I found personally fascinating in this whole story is uh, these tensions and contradictions. As we, as I said before, there were Bundists who spoke Hebrew and there were Zionists who spoke Yiddish, as as we know. It was it was never black and white, basically. There were people who kind of were just in between and didn't really know how to identify themselves either. So yeah, this is what I wanted to end on. I hope for the listeners that my ramblings make sense and uh i'll just leave it up to you to to reflect or close or you know do whatever you want with this <laughs> well one of the great ironies of yiddish and hebrew is that the positions are almost exactly reversed 150 years ago 100 years ago um, the argument perhaps against studying hebrew was Hebrew is the language of your perfect dead prophets, and Yiddish is the language of the living Jewish street. Yeah. And why do you always so fixated on the past? 
And now, you know, Hasidim aside, Yiddish is the language of um, the idealized dead. And Hebrew is the language of the imperfect um, and generally deeply fucked up Jewish street um, in the country that I believe half the Jews in the world live. And so there is always this tension to that. I'm not learning Yiddish because I think that every Jew needs to learn Yiddish. I'm learning it because you can't write about the Bund without it. They did mm. every single one of their uh, documents in it until, um, I think, until 2003, they were primarily working in Yiddish. I, I wonder why they didn't take off in America, right? Um, <laughs> But I think that any time you learn a language, even this, even this one, which I'm learning to commune with the dead, you're opening up yourself to another world. And I mean, that's mm. why I, I do it with love. And um, I wanted to end with a quote, too. Um, it was a quote, actually, about Zionism and Bundism that was written by a Bundist um, in 1947. And, you know, he was writing this reflecting um, on a world where most... Bundists had been killed. Um, I think 97% of the Jews that stayed in Poland had been killed. So, you know, most Bundists mm -hmm. among them. And he wrote this, trying to defend his movement that he'd given his life to. And he said, The great Jewish catastrophe has weakened the position of the Bund. In Poland, in the land of the greatest Jewish creativity, one cannot find those millions of Jews those workers, artisans, regular people from the black earth of whose lives and struggles the Bund drew the juices of growth and development. The tragedy is not only for the Bund, but for the entire Jewish people. One cannot speak of victors and losers on the Jewish street. War has left all parts of the Jewish people defeated. The idea of the Bund is a deep belief in mankind. The tendencies that are hostile to the Bund are based on a lack of this belief. The idea of belief in mankind is not popular today. In these last years, we have seen it become deeply debased, despoiled, and spat upon. But if man is at heart a beast, no amount of running away will help. There is no redemption for mankind, then there is no redemption for Jews. The beast will hunt those who run and meet them everywhere. If the belief disappears, then hope disappears. The victory of the Zionist idea is a victory for the failure of belief in mankind. It is a complete victory for hopelessness. The Bund has always put its cards on socialism, which means a better future for all humanity and for all the people that make it up. If the dream of socialism becomes true, then there is no one to run, fr there is no one to run from. If the dream dissipates, like so many of other, man other better dreams of mankind, then there is nowhere to run to. The mirage of a little statelet surrounded by enemies is no amulet against anti-Semitism and extermination. The Bund has always fought for continuity, for creative national life, for doikait, for hearness, for the right to remain rooted in the ground where the Jewish masses live and fight. This idea received from Nazism the most painful blow. The remnants of the Jewish, Jewish masses lurch through the camps, wander around homeless, or float like splinters on the foaming waves of the stormy post-war world. But with every day it becomes clearer that the pathway to healing those wounds leads not through increasing the number of helpless wanderers, not through increasing the number of uprooted refugees, but through building and rebuilding. That's why I think that the boon deserves listening to. Because the person who wrote that was not a soppy, cosseted, liberal with a six-figure academic job. It was someone who had just seen his entire world destroyed, and that's still what he believed. That's amazing. Uh, Molly, is there anything you wanted to add, or like I forgot to ask, or forgot to mention, or whatever? No, this was great. It was such a pleasure to talk about these things with you. Yeah, same here. As I said, I haven't talked about this in a long time, so this was very refreshing. Thanks a lot for your time. You're welcome. Thank you so much.